All right, on for the first time, we got Gabe Diorman from Power Mizzou. And uh, hey, I was not kidding when I said, Gabe, you, our audience, you were probably the most requested guest we've had over the last six months. So it's, uh, it's, real, it's a real honor to have you on. Yeah, I don't know if that's a compliment to me or if your people need to find better guests, uh, but I'm impressed you pronounced my name correctly the first time. Nobody ever does, so well done. Yeah, no, I no, genuinely, I, I love listening to your show, particularly uh, during the football season, of course, because that's what we focus on. But uh, the Sundays, well, I guess you guys do them Saturday night. I don't catch it till Sunday morning, but you guys do a, a hell of a job over at Power Mizzou. We've had Gerard on the show a number of times, so. Can't thank you uh, enough for all your coverage you do for the Missouri program. But and I promise I'm not even going to ask you any basketball questions. So I'm, I'll give you a break here. <laughs> yeah, because this year Missouri fans will turn it off at that point. So <laughs> what a weird time this is, Gabe. Where I don't know is it fair to go into the season with playoff expectations? That may be a bit much, but. I think it's realistic to to kind of have that in your head if you're a Missouri fan. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I always kind of differentiate between hopes and expectations. Hopes, absolutely. Realistic hopes, I, I think that's what all Missouri fans are shooting for, want. I think the people in the program think that's a, a, a definite possibility. But I don't think you can say expectations because if you go nine and three at Missouri in the SEC, like that's a good year. It might not get you in. I mean, look, this year – you know, 10 and two was, was borderline. I mean, Ole Miss was 10 and two and probably would have been out of a 12 team playoff until the very last ranking, they would have gotten that last spot. So, you know, I, I don't know if you can go in expecting it, but, but that's what Missouri fans are shooting for. Uh, kind of, I, I guess some people would say this is hitting it is exactly the right time. And some people might say it's hitting one year too late, I guess. <laughs> well, and, and to that point, Gabe, I mean, I don't know how long you've been covering Missouri. How, how long you've been covering this program? Uh, Twenty-one years here, um, and then I was at the the student TV station for for a couple years in college. So I took a, a four and a half year hiatus and went up and lived in the wilderness in South Dakota, and then I uh, came back in '03. I did ask that to to age you or anything like that, but to set up this next question, just have you ever seen it turn so quickly? Because I don't know about you, but I mean, two, three weeks into last season, fans were, they were fed up with drink. They were done with Brady Cook. I mean, we were getting, mm -hmm. we got a voicemail line. They were calling in about what a good guy he is and, and he needs to be a good guy on the bench and, and turn this thing over to Sam Horn. Yet now, Gabe, we do like, you know, who, who are the top five coaches in the SEC? And they'll be damned if Eli is not in that list. If he's not, then I'm a fool. Yet, Six months ago, they would have been happy with another coach. So in your time covering Missouri, have you ever seen it turn this quickly? 2013 was pretty similar. Um, they went five and seven, four and eight, something like that, their first year in the SEC. And, you know, it had a ton of injuries, but still there were a lot of people after that 2012 season. And I, I wasn't quite there, but I understood where they were coming from that said, you know, appreciate Gary for everything he did. He got us in this league, all that. But maybe maybe he's not the guy that's cut out to do it here. And then they come out in 13 and, you know, win 12 games and win the East and uh, James Franklin's healthy. And all of a sudden, when you're starting quarterbacks healthy, everything looks better. It's kind of weird how that works. Um, but it, that was similar. But the difference is in 2012 to 13, it was injuries. Last year to this year, it was just mostly the guys they had just getting a lot better, right? Brady Cook went from a guy that was an average starting quarterback in the Power Five, maybe a little bit below, I, I think is fair, and then turned into, like you said, a top, I don't know, top third, top half of the league type guy. Uh, Luther Burden went from a guy who had all this potential, but let's be honest, he, he hadn't really done it. He didn't really do it his freshman year to – all of a sudden, the guy that you've got to know where he is. Cody Schrader went from a guy that I started the year saying, look, I, I really like the kid, but if you're serious about winning big things in the SEC, like this can't be your starting running back to I voted him third on my Heisman list, you know? So, <laughs> I, I mean, um, there's some things that, that like, I don't even blame people. People try to make you feel bad about what you thought at the time, right? Like, I wrote a column after they beat Middle Tennessee 23-19, 
And I catch hell for it every day. Like people think I dislike Eli personally because I wrote after that game, what happened to the guy who came in here with all this swagger and was running flea flickers against LSU and leaving his defense out there for a goal line stand? I said, all of a sudden now I'm looking at this guy that's super conservative. And oh, by the way, I watch his offense. And if I didn't know they had hired a new offensive coordinator, I wouldn't know they changed anything. Well, then a week later, they go out and beat Kansas State, and it all kind of flips, and everybody wants to say, why are you an idiot? Why do you hate Eli? Like, I never hated him, but it was okay to have doubts at that time. And he was a 500 coach coming off a 23-19 win over Middle Tennessee State. Like, if you didn't have doubts, you're either a liar or just as soon as somebody puts a Missouri shirt on, you know, they're, uh, you know, our Lord and Savior walking the earth until they're fired. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Well, I, I get a lot of questions from uh, other fan bases. They're just curious about Missouri and the NIL and and the push into that. And I think personally, I think it's great for college football because uh, all all these guys. I mean, we're, so much money being generated in this sport. It's it had to filter down. And I and clearly, I th you know we're still not doing it a hundred percent correctly. But <laughs> right. it, it's it's the path we have. And credit Missouri and and the university and the state. I know they've changed the laws. What what all has kind of led to this push to where Missouri? You know they're not the at the very top of the NIL game. You know you think of the, the Texas schools and Oregon and, and and things of that nature. But Missouri's not far off. What what has led to this momentum to where Missouri is is among the top? You know maybe fifteen to programs in the country when it comes to NIL. Well, I, I think it's just this confluence of like Missouri's always had a lot of people that went to school here with a lot of money. I, I mean, uh, you know, the names might not be it. They don't have the one guy that's maybe Phil Knight or Boone Pickens, but there's a lot of money um, in, in people who have gone to school here. But they've never really been united around this cause of, you know, hey, let's let's see if we can pull this together and do something for Mizzou. I think Eli Drinkwitz deserves credit for unifying them. I think Desiree Reed Francois does. Like they've all kind of decided let's pull in the same direction here. And, you know, I think Drink's biggest strength is his personality, his people skills. And I think he figured out very early on, like, I don't think you'd be a head coach these days and do all of it. Do the football part, do the recruiting part, do the donor part, you know, do the, the baby kissing circuit and all that. So you've got to decide – Am I going to be the guy that focuses on the on-field stuff? And then I need like a general manager to go get the rest of it. I think Eli kind of became the general manager. And that's not discrediting his football knowledge. He knows a hell of a lot more about it, surely, than I do. But I, I think he said, if I can line all these people up and get all this going in the right direction, and then I can bring in a guy that I trust to to run this offense, you know, it could take off. And um, they've managed to do that. And then – you know, winning's a drug, man. Like you, you get some of it coming in, and then you go out and go eleven and two and beat Ohio State, and all of a sudden people are lining up. And you know, this roster is, uh, it, like you said, I would, I would say top ten to fifteen in the country in IL wise. And if he goes out and makes that playoff, and maybe even hosts a game, like I've told people in the program, Eli could stand at midfield at the opening kickoff of a playoff game and personally insult every fan in the stands and say, oh, by the way, write me a check. And they would do it because that's winning is addictive like that. Um, you know, and I think the misconception about NIL was always, well, all this is going to mean is Georgia and Alabama and Ohio State and all these other teams are going to pour in the most money and they're going to separate themselves. Kirby Smart, Nick Saban, those guys don't have to pay the price that Ole Miss does, that Missouri does, that some of these next level, the people spending the big money are the people trying to catch those people because Kirby Smart can go into living rooms and say, hey, you know, we won back-to-back -back national titles and we we're like a couple plays away from winning a third. So, yeah, we're going to give you some money. But they get a little dis they get the winner's discount a little bit, right? The, the the teams that I think are spending the big money are the ones that are trying to get to that level that have maybe never really been there. Mm -hmm. And how well suited is the state to kind of keep this momentum? Because not only, you know, all these coaches, when they come in, they say, we're going to close the borders and all this. And, and they, that's a nice narrative. And you try to mm -hmm. do it. But 
I can't think of many like Missouri that have landed uh, guys off other rosters like Caden Green, Mookie Cooper, that had ties that left that for whatever reason wanted to, to return home. So you got that too. And then and then obviously there's there's a lot of talent in and around the state in, in the local areas there. How how suited is it for, for Missouri to maybe not win eleven games every year, but just be, you know, a, a top half SEC team under drink? Well, for the next few years, especially, I mean, they're out here literally writing state laws to make it legal to pay in-state kids early, right? I mean, <laughs> hey, you can think of it what you want, but they're operating within the system they've been given for as long as it lasts. Um, but the ironic part is this year was their worst year recruiting in-state under Drinkwitz. I think they landed one of the top 10 kids. Now, it was a big one, williams Winery, right? Number, I think we've got him number eight in the country. So uh, certainly a big one, but what he's done that, nobody else has ever done in Missouri and that frankly I didn't think was possible at Missouri is go into other states and get these four-star kids you know now that look they're not landing five stars from Georgia yet but Sam Horn even before NIL was was a four-star quarterback out of the state of Georgia top 100 kid Missouri didn't get kids like that unless they were from Kansas City or St. Louis in the past so he's done a great job of that um I mean you guys see all the he's got a he's got a personality that sells right I mean he's a He's a funny dude most of the time, depending on which side of it you're on, right? Either either funny or, hey, maybe back off a little bit, wh whichever way you want to view it. But um, they've got a chance here, and I think everybody at Missouri knows, hey, we've got a two- or three-year window here before, A, some other people start doing what we're doing in this, or B, they just come in and change this whole system and take away the advantage that we've managed to find in this. So I, I think they'll do everything they can in those two or three years. And then I'm I'm sure you've heard this question about a hundred times since the season ended. But how do they replace Cody Schrader, who, who like you yeah. said, you voted him third on the Heisman? I think the first time he caught my attention, Gabe was a, was a spring game. I think it must it had to have been his first one at Mizzou, and it was like the second half, and he was just trucking people. But I just assumed that was the walk on that never gets touches, so he was making the most of it. Never in a million years did I think he'd be arguably the best running back in the SEC. So how in the world do they possibly replace him? Well, it's it's interesting. I mean, because it is the most replaceable position in sports, right? If he's, I, I mean, that line deserves a lot of credit. I think what Brady and Luther did the first half of the season, if you look at Cody's numbers, first five, six games, they were decent, but they were nothing like what he did in the second half of the year. And I think that has a lot to do with teams starting going, Hey, we got to make somebody else beat us besides Luther Burden over our, over the top all the time. So I think he benefited from that. Um, and I don't mean any of that to take away from Cody. Like he was a he was clearly a special kid, and he's really tough to replace. I don't think you're going to throw one kid in there and all of a sudden he's going to break the school rushing record next year too. Um, you're going to have to do it with a few guys. Um, and you know, like nobody saw this come. I don't think Cody saw that coming. I know Eli Drinkwitz didn't see it coming, and. You know, when you do what I do and you follow recruiting so closely for so long, like every walk on who comes in, people are like, oh, I, I like this kid, man. I think he's the one that could do this. And you just kind of get conditioned to go, guys, there's a reason that 85 dudes have a scholarship on this team and he's not one of them. Right. Like, yeah, it would be a cool story, but it would be very surprising if he gets more than a couple carries a game. And then Cody Schrader happens, and what that leads to now is literally 20 years of, we'll never pay attention to recruiting rankings because you remember what Cody Schrader did? <laughs> it probably still is going to be the exception. Yeah. Well, uh, speaking of uh, Brady Cook and Luther Burden, you know, obviously they were just so impactful last season. Now year two under Kirby Moore offense, it's usually that year two when, when, this, mm -hmm. when the offenses really take off. So, Let's just assume that that there is a continued progression and Missouri, you know, stays as one of the elite in the SEC. I, again, that's that's a big assumption. But if it does, I I, I assume there's got to be some Heisman buzz for 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 one of those guys. Who do you think is a more logical Heisman candidate if everything breaks right, Brady Cook or Luther Burden? Logical the way logic should work or logical the way the Heisman Trophy voting works are two different things, right? Um, I mean, Luther is a top 10 draft pick. He is He's the best football player on this team. I don't think it's particularly close. So if you're Missouri, like, 
he's the guy I start a campaign for, right? Because he's he if you can teach him to actually catch a punt instead of let it bounce too, he can add to just the wide receiver stuff. He can do some wildcat. You can give him some jet sweeps. You can find a lot of different ways to get him the ball. But the way Heisman campaigns work, if Missouri is a top 10 team, if they are 11 and one, if they are in the running for an SEC championship, whatever, that's going to be Brady Cook getting the votes. And so do you want to be actively promoting this other guy taking potential votes away from the quarterback of a playoff team? You know, um, I mean, I, I've I've had a Heisman vote. Well, my first vote, I was 14 and my dad let me uh, fill out his ballot. But I've, I've actually had a vote for about 15, 17 years, something like that. And just over that time, it's it doesn't go to the best player in college football, right? It goes to the quarter uh, quarterback on a really good team more often than not. Um, so, like, Luther's the best player on this team. But if you tell me who's got better odds to win the Heisman, I'd go Brady. Mm-hmm. And how impactful do you think it is losing a Blake Baker, the defensive coordinator to LSU, and uh, now bringing in this uh, Corey Patoon who – from South Alabama. I'm, I'm largely unfamiliar with him. Right. What can you tell us about that hire? Well, um, not a ton. Um, I, I, what I find really interesting and the question that, that we'll need to find out about Corey over the next, you know, 12 months is uh, the head coach of that program just got hired to be the DC at Alabama. So was this Corey Batoon's defense or was this Kane Womack's defense that Corey Batoon called? You know, and, and there's a difference, and I don't know what the answer is, um, but there's a difference there. Flip side of that is when he hired Kirby Moore last year, I legitimately had to Google him. I, I didn't – like, if you would have said, is there a guy named Kirby Moore in college football, I would have said, I mean, I guess you're asking me for a reason, so probably, but I didn't know anything about him, and he came in, and really I thought – should have been Missouri's uh, nominee for the Broyles Award and, and really probably should have been like a semifinalist for that. I thought he did a phenomenal job. Um, Blake did a good job here, no question. Um, you know, but if you drill down on the numbers, like they were a good defense. They were not an elite defense. Um, they were 34th or something total defense. You know, they they didn't take the ball away a ton. They were they were really good at just kind of stopping people, but they didn't have a lot of a lot of takeaways and such. So, you know, I, I think if the offense gets a little better, you can handle a little step back because that was a defense that had three, four guys that I think are going to be played in the NFL next year. Um, and you've got to replace all those guys now, too. Now, I, I'm sure you've uh... – you may have not memorized it yet, but next year's schedule, I don't know if you saw this, but I, I put out a tweet where I, what I did was I went back and looked at uh, every upcoming SEC schedule, and what I did was I just racked up the combined opponent records of, of how those teams performed last year, and Missouri was the only one, I believe, out of the SEC that their opponents in 24 had a losing record in 23. So, yeah, I mean, this is a very manageable yeah. slate, which is pretty bizarre. Now, now there's some unique road games in there, but um, it, is it, it, could it possibly be where Missouri even has a better record, but they may not be as good? I mean, that, yeah. that seems like it could happen. Yeah, I mean, look, since this schedule came out, I said, I mean, you assume when you're in the SEC, you don't get an easy schedule, right? But if you have to be in the SEC, it's about as close as you can get. I mean, Drink might be trying to see, hey, can we swap Alabama for Mississippi State or Kentucky maybe? <laughs> then it gets a little easier, but I, that's about it. I mean, you're playing Alabama, and, like, it's still Alabama. But – it did maybe get a little bit easier here in the last three weeks, right? Because because uh, they're being coached just by a guy that made the playoff last year, not by a guy that dominated college football for the last two decades. Um, and then, you know, A&M at College Station, like, yeah, that's a game you can go lose, but A&M's got a new coach and hadn't lit the world on fire. Uh, you get Auburn here. You get Oklahoma here. I mean, I think Missouri fans will look at this schedule and expect to be 11-1. and one. I think if you go game-by-game game odds, I think they will be favored in 10, probably. I, I still think there's a decent chance Oklahoma would be favored here, or maybe A&M looks really good in the first four games under Mike Elko and they're an underdog at A&M. But other than that, I mean, you know, you're playing 
Arkansas and you're dodging LSU, you're dodging Georgia, you know, so there's a lot of winnable games there. Is there one that the fans really want to win more than any other? Because I'm, I'm starting to see this budding rivalry with Oklahoma. I, I had, yeah. obviously, I know the history there, but uh, I mean, I'm speaking to all these Oklahoma people. They're like, my God, our fans, we, we, we had forgotten how much they, uh, apparently they hate Missouri now. Well, and they never really used to, because I, I saw your guys' uh, interview with Josh McQuistion a few weeks ago. Missouri fans got mad at it, but I've known Josh for a long time, and he's 100% right. It's like it's like 77 to 15 or something. That's not a rivalry. That's a it's a r- rivalry on one side. One side really wants to win that rivalry, you know, but I grew up in, in the Big Eight where it was you had your team that you liked, and then you picked either Oklahoma or Nebraska because one of them was going to win the league, so you had to have somebody to root for that day. Uh, but this is turning into a little bit of a rivalry now because Missouri is going to put a team on the field with Luther Burden, Theo Weiss, Chris McClellan from Tulsa, and Caden Green. Um, that will will spark things up a little bit. Um, you know, now will the casual fan who's in the stands know that? Or is this a Twitter message board rivalry a little bit more? I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but you know, this is a I, I mean. How do you know about this about the SEC? I mean, you've got your programs that say, well, we should never lose to that team. And Missouri or Oklahoma fans absolutely think they should not ever lose a football game to the University of Missouri. And so if Missouri could pull that one off, now, is it the one Missouri fans most want to win? I don't know. You go win in Tuscaloosa, I think you probably just stamped your playoff bid, right? Uh, because you can lose another one somewhere else. And if you're 10 and 2, even with a win over Alabama, I think you're probably in. But I don't know if you polled Missouri fans, which one do you want more? I, I think it'd be pretty close. You know, you just made me th- think of something, though, Gabe. I mean, it, Missouri's kind of always had that chip on their shoulder. And when we were at media days, I mean, I I swear we don't we don't, uh, you know, set people up for these. But they just, you know, whether it's a South Carolina writer, an Arkansas <laughs> yeah. writer, Kentucky, yeah. Tennessee, on and on. They're just they chalk Missouri up as an automatic win. I, I don't know why. And they and they think it's not a good program and, and this, that, and the other. It, but I, I have to believe that benefits drinking company and, and keeps that chip on their shoulder. How, how important do you think that is moving forward to keep it despite all the success so that so that they can kind of kind of be the blue collar uh, of the SEC, so to speak? Yeah, you know, everybody likes to say nobody believed in us except the guys in this locker room right now. Last year's Missouri team, 100% right. Like, I picked them seven and five, and I wasn't sure I believed they'd be that good. So um, they, they were right about it last year. But I gave up on the trying to convince anyone that, you know, the whole world isn't against you when uh, Kirby Smart managed to convince his players that someone picked them seven and five the year they won the national <laughs> title. Um, so say whatever you want. Um, but, no, I, I think there's – you know, I was just uh, – I met up with my my son this weekend. He's, uh, he's 26 now, and he was kind of asking, like, about that, like – why do these other programs kind of still talk about Missouri? Like the new kid, they've been here. Tw- I'm like, Oh, they still talk about Arkansas and South Carolina is the new kid. Like if you weren't in the sec in 1954 or whatever, <laughs> like you don't even count, you're not really in this club, man. You know, like you can, you can be in the room, but you can't be in the corner room of the room. Um, you know, so I think with Arkansas and South Carolina fans, I think there's a little bit of, Oh, finally, there's somebody that's newer than us. We go pick on them the way we got picked on for 20 years, <laughs> you know. Um, and it's funny, Arkansas fans say we should never lose to Missouri. Well, Missouri fans say we should never lose in football to Kentucky. Well, why not? They, until last year, they've been a better program than you for eight years, you know. I mean, when they do it every year, and this whole we should never lose to, I, I don't know, man. I mean, we're not talking logic here, right? We're just, we're just throwing out angry stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, how? Uh, Harrison Mevis, what what a you know he's going to go down as a Mizzou legend now. Wh- who's next in line? I mean, because most times I, I think kicker nobody even pays attention to, but sure. I feel like uh, he's been synonymous with Missouri in, in drinks program here. How, how big of a, a question mark is is the next kicker f- for the Tigers? Yeah, it's always a question until you see him do it. They got a kid uh, out of Liberty, Missouri, last year named Blake Craig. He'll be a redshirt freshman this year. Um, if they like him, you know, I, kicker rankings are all who knows, right? Because um, it's such a difference from high school to college. But but they like him. They didn't go out and get a transfer kicker. So that tells me they think he can take over and do the job. Um, Mevis was so interesting because, like, he was just automatic for two years. 
And then he his junior year was it was pretty rough. And oddly, you felt better about Harrison Mevis lining up for that 62 yard kick than you maybe did on a 32 yard kick. It was really weird. It was like the further away he got, the more automatic he became, you know. So uh, it, it, it's definitely like that's a spot, right? Nobody talks about it until it matters. And then all of a sudden at the end of the year, you look up and your kicker might be the the reason you either are or are not in the playoff. Yeah. And, and you mentioned drink, drink and, and just kind of how you, obviously Mizzou fans love him. The rest kind of hate him. Uh, for his kind of trolling nature. Do, do you personally have a favorite Drinkowitz troll? Man, some of them, honestly, I just say they're just like these one liners that you just kind of they just water off a duck's back. Right. Like sometimes they're <laughs> going to be directed at you. Sometimes somebody else in the room, whatever. You know, I wore a plaid shirt to media one day. He called me a lumberjack. I'm like, hey, man, give me an <laughs> NIL deal. I will do give me a brawny paper towels deal or something there. Um <laughs> You know, the the one that I think everybody talks about that I wasn't a huge fan of was the lightsaber deal. It was a little <laughs> dancing on Dan Mullen's grave. But it, 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 here's my thing. Like, everybody thinks drink compares drink and lane. Drink wants to be Steve Spurrier, man. But to be Steve Spurrier, you got to win like Steve Spurrier. And so – I thought he went through a little, you know, I, I remember him on with fine bomb last year and Hey, my dad told me I need to shut up till I go win some games. And he dialed it back a little bit. I'm interested to see what happens now that he's got 11 win season in his pocket. I, I feel like we might see some, we might see some good one liners coming out this year, you know, uh, quite potentially. I, I don't think they're on the schedule, but he seems to like to take a, a few shots at the, the guys in Knoxville when he can. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. All right, <laughs> final thing for you, Gabe. Really appreciate your time. Uh, can you give us any hope, any information whatsoever on the series with Kansas? Will that will that ever be renewed? How often do you get talked about it? Because I, I remember a couple of years ago, I'm not into politics at all, right? But I, I, I can't even remember the guy's name, but... I think he was going to be a vice president candidate. And, and I remember he was saying, I'm trying to get Kansas and Missouri on the field. Yeah. The guys got my vote just, just for that. Is Will this game ever be played again? It's on the schedule for 25 and I, I think 26 is the second one. I know they've got two games on the schedule. Um, now it'll be interesting to see what happens because Missouri's schedule there is weird. Like they have one year with, road games at Kansas and at Illinois. I don't think you want to do that in the same year. Is the SEC going to nine? What's that mean for some of these games? But, yeah, they are down to play in 2025. Um, I think that game's in Columbia uh, because, you know, with the whole uh, Brett McMurphy report that Missouri dodged Kansas right. in the Liberty Bowl, Drinkwood said, <laughs> hey, they're coming here in two years, whatever. I'm ready to play them then. Um, so, yeah, it's on the schedule. Um, I think – the big one to get back, and the football fans hate it when I say this, but once the basketball game came back, that kind of opened the door for pretty much everything else, right? Missouri fans always said, well, we're not – why would we play them in basketball if they won't play us in football? And I always said, well, it's more of a basketball rival. I mean, outside of 2007, this wasn't – this was never a – like you kind of hated them on principle because they had MU or KU on their helmet – but this was never really a, a football rivalry until that 07 game. Um, but yeah, it's it's coming back. And what I've figured out the last couple of years, last couple of times I've gone to Allen Fieldhouse, like it's cool to me that they play, but it's not the same, man. It, it like when you're in a different league, when you don't play every year, it's not what I grew up with, and it's not what those of us who are over 30 remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those. South Carolina games are a lot more meaningful than, than Kansas right. these days. And, you know what? And honestly, in football, what I the one I'd rather see, go get me a home and home and one in Kansas City with Nebraska. Like hey, that you'll sell that out three places. Um, you know, they're now the roles are reversed a little bit. Nebraska might be going, uh, man, we really need to get this one to get to six, you know. <laughs> but um, but uh I, I think that Personally, that would get me more excited than MUKU in football. I, I'm uh, probably now. I'm you, all the Missouri fans are going to be saying, "Never have that guy on again." He's an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I promise you, they will not. Gabe Diorman, Power <laughs> Mizzou. Before you go, can you tell the audience? I'm sure they know already, but where can they follow you, and where can they find your work? 
Yeah, on Twitter, at PowerMizzou.com. Um, I got rid of many of the trolls when I took my name off the Twitter account and just started tweeting from the site account. Um, they don't like to attack a brand nearly as much as a human, so that's good. Um, <laughs> PowerMizzou.com on the Rivals Network. Come uh, check it out. You can even read some of it for free, but we would appreciate it if you paid us anyway.